When I look at the room today, I, I am convicted, first of all, before speaking about the domestic church. And what is the domestic church? The church at home. But I am convicted, first and foremost, of the reality that we, we, the people of God, the faithful, by God's grace, of the Orthodox Christian Church, are continuing the, the very same work that Christ began through the apostles. You have to remember that when Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, is incarnate on the earth, sojourns among men, ministers for a short period of time, historically speaking, three years, that he chooses 12, 12 people, not 1,200 people, not 12,000 people, 12 men. He chooses 70 disciples through the holy apostles. There are a few, a few men and women around him in the beginning. And yet from that 12, from that 70, from the 120 at Pentecost, from the 3,000 that converted at Holy Pentecost, the work of Christ was done. Tens of thousands, millions become Orthodox Christians over time. Entire nations are converted to Christ because that few people did the work of God and did the work of the Holy Apostles. And so when we gather at these events, I always have a, a twofold desire to share that we, we stand here today gathered as the universal church, the Orthodox Church of the world. And yet we also are here a few people, relatively speaking, gathered to do the work of God right here, right here in this place. So wherever you are or wherever you are from or wherever you are going, do the work of God there because where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst of them. And every great work begins with exactly what we are doing here today. So God bless you all for being here. And I am blessed to be a part of this activity. So I was assigned the topic to present to you today, the domestic church, the church at home. And it is a, a natural topic to come off of Father Damaskinos' work on marriage. Because we have to know, we have to have an idea as a married couple, as an Orthodox family, what it is that we are supposed to be doing at home. What is it? But before we delve into the activities of the domestic church, the church at home, it's very natural for us to, far, first of all, contemplate the meaning of that. What is the domestic church? Because there are a few things we, we want to understand and a few things that we do not want to confuse with the teaching of the church. So the basic question, is the domestic church, because we can call the home church the domestic church, is that any different from the church at large, the universal church? Is there some sort of distinction that we can make between the church that we attend on Sunday, hopefully more often than that, and the church at home? Because we have, particularly for Americans here in America, we have a tendency to compartmentalize things, to, to think of the church at home as opposed to the church at church. And this is, as a nation, this is part of our Protestant inheritance where there were false ideas about the church sown in America in the early days where Protestant teachings influenced the idea that there were three divine institutions established by God, that there was the state, that there was the church, and that there was the home. And although those three things are certainly addressed in Scripture, and they are, they are topics of discussion within the church and topics of prayer for us, we have to make sure that we are not accidentally compartmentalizing our Christian life at home particularly. In the ideal Orthodox setting, in the ideal Orthodox country, not only is the home a part of the church, but it, the church is a part also of the government, ideally. We don't see separation between those things. And why is this? Why, why is there no separation? Why is it that it may be an error for me to finish worshiping at the temple, such as here at All Saints, 
and then to go home and, and make the mistake of thinking that I am then taking on a different spirituality or a different ecclesiastical effort in my house. Why is that a problem? And the universal understanding that answers that question is that you are the church. You are the church. The people of God, the faithful who are baptized and chrismated into the Orthodox Church, are the church. The temple, the, the physical location where we are able to gather on Sunday, is merely, merely as beautiful as it is, as well decorated as it is, as conducive to worship as it is, it is merely a physical place, like this, this temple here. It is a physical place for the church to gather. For the members make up the body. And you have to remember that as we talk about the family at home, you are the church. You are the church. You don't go to church. We say that often, well, I'm going to church this Sunday. But really, you don't go to church. I like to tell my people, you are the church, or as grammatically incorrect as this is, you be the church. You, you am the church. The church is you. Again, Christ tells us where two or three are, are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so the activity of the domestic church is simply a continuation of the life of the body of Christ, the church, at home rather than at the temple. At home in personal prayer or family prayer as opposed to being at the temple having corporate prayer, corporate worship. At home having familial education, Bible study, prayer, discussion about God as opposed to gathering as the complete assembly in the temple and having corporate prayer and corporate study. So that is the most key element that I want to communicate today, and we see the reality of this when we look at Scripture, particularly St. Paul speaking to the Corinthians, that we are, as the church, formed in the image of the Holy Trinity. We are a unity of persons. Think of how that applies to us in light of our understanding of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, one God of one essence, one divine substance, and yet manifested in three persons, three unique and knowable persons, not individual aspects of God, not God appearing to be the Father or appearing to be the Son or the Holy Spirit, but God, three persons, and yet one nature. And, and the nature of the church is very similar because the church is created in the image of the Holy Trinity. And so when I say that we am the church, we be the church, it's an expression of the fact that you are all individual members, persons, but like in the image of the Holy Trinity, you are united into one body, one body of believers. And so we hear this in St. Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.10. St. Paul says, let all of you agree with one another that there may be no divisions, that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought, that is, in nous and in gnosis, that you would be united perfectly in the, the understanding and the experience of your soul, as well as in the knowledge and the information that you have gathered in your mind, in your brain. And I use this, this scripture when I am teaching catechism, at St. Lawrence Academy, where we have a kindergarten through eighth grade, and I teach a special eighth grade catechism there for the children that are preparing to go into high school. And listen to these words, though. I tell you, I always say this to the faithful. We become so overly familiar with Scripture that we hear profound things being spoken from the mouth of God or the mouth of the apostles, and, and we, we hardly respond to them at all. Imagine if this was the homework that you were given to take home and to make a reality in your home. St. Paul to the Corinthians, let all of you agree with one another. How many of you actually agree with one another all of the time? 
This is a divine calling. This is calling us to be persons of one body as the persons, the divine persons of the Holy Trinity are one. We will never be God. We will never be divine, but we will certainly uh, become like God and fulfill the reality of being created in his image. So let all of you agree one another that there may be no divisions. How many of us live in a world where there are zero divisions among us? In our parish, in our family, between parents and children or siblings? So this is an incredible calling that we are being, being called to. That you may be agreeing with one another and having no divisions, that you may be perfectly united with one another, not somewhat united, not pleasantly united, but perfectly united. And when Orthodox Christians talk about perfect union, when the holy apostles talk about perfect union, we're talking about divine union, that we are to be united perfectly by God working in us as his body, by the inspiration and the grace of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, St. Paul continues, For as the body is one, think of this, this is the church he's talking about. As the body is one, yet has many members, all the members of that one body, though they are many, are only one body. And in the same way is Christ. Christ is undivided. We are all baptized into one body, And you are the body of Christ. That is St. Paul. You are the body of Christ. And St. Paul to the Romans 12, 5, Therefore, being many, think about us, even us here in this room, or our parish, or the vicariate. Therefore, we, being many, many of us here today, we are one body in Christ. One body in Christ. So how does that apply to the family? Well, first and foremost, because when we go to begin talking about the domestic church, the church at home, it must, that discussion must be based on the principle that we are, the church is one. No compartmentalization for us. As Orthodox Christians, when we finish Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning, or we finish Great Vespers on Saturday night, or we have finished Vespers or Matins in the morning or in the evening during the week for our weekday services, whether it is a wedding or an ordination, a baptism, whether we have gathered for Holy Unction, when we leave the church building, that that service being done, that prayer having been finished, Nothing changes about us spiritually. We go from being prayerful Christians in the church building to prayerful Christians out on the street, in our car, at our work, at school, and ultimately and, and, and fundamentally at our home. You are the church. It's so important for you to understand that. These things are so fundamental and ultimately very simple, but the reality is something that escapes us often. We, we, we become consumed with our own cares, our own worries, and then we think that we are having a momentary relief from all of that by bo- going to liturgy on Sunday morning. We very well may be relieved from our worries and cares going to divine liturgy. We ought to be for confessing and receiving Holy Communion and not relieved something is wrong. But we can't accidentally believe or convince ourselves based on on non-Orthodox teachings that when we leave church on Sunday that somehow we have left church. We are the church, and where we go, the church is. So although we can divide out the home church, the domestic church, for discussion, it is not divided from the church. It is literally the church in our homes. So please keep that in mind. And we see that in Scripture, it is the family from the beginning. It is the family that builds the church. Christ is working. The apostles are going to do his work. But it is the family that responds. In my my thesis on the parish as community, I drew out the fact that, that 
the Trinity, think about this, this is theology for a moment, but you can, you can do this, put your theological caps on. The Trinity is a communion of persons, divine persons, that are united perfectly in oneness. And when we study scripture, we see that it is perfectly natural and, and predictable based on the nature of the Trinity, that God would reveal himself to communities of persons, not to individual people. It is not Noah alone who hears from God. It is Noah and his family, his household. It is not Abraham alone, but Abraham and his whole family, his seed, generations being blessed by God revealing himself to him. It is not a Moses alone that God reveals himself to. The bur- in the burning bush, God speaks. The Logos, the Christ, ultimately speaks to Moses. But Moses goes, therefore, to the people of Israel. And very soon he has at his side Aaron and Joshua and others who, who are the communion of leaders. And so when we study God's revelation to mankind very carefully, we see that the Trinity by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the direction of the Logos, the second person, by the will of the Father, manifests itself in communities of other people. And when we study Scripture well and the early church documents well, we see that it is families upon which the church is built and ultimately the parish is built. We see examples of this straight out of Scripture. In Luke 19.9, It is Zacchaeus and his household that Christ goes to. It is not Zacchaeus alone. Christ encounters Zacchaeus in the tree. He's in a crowd, by the way. Christ is almost never alone unless he purposefully goes up onto the mountain alone to pray. He's surrounded by people. He is in the midst of community always. And he encounters Zacchaeus in the tree, and yet, where do they go from there? Christ doesn't say come down from the tree because you and I are going to talk. I I am going to reveal myself to you. He says, no, come down from the tree because we are going to your house today. And it is Zacchaeus and his entire household that is saved. In Acts 16, 15, we see a very similar account with Lydia and her entire household. In Acts 16, 31, we see the Philippian jailer and his household are saved because God reveals himself to Ultimately, we find pre-existing communities of people. So when we look at the history, particularly of the family, we see that it is the family from which the, the church as we know it, parishes, arise. In the, in the very early church, you have to remember that, that it is Christian households, literally homes, wherein the Christians are gathering in order to break bread together, to have the Holy Eucharist, to have communion. They were still, in the early century, the Christians were still worshiping in the temple, the Jewish temple. They were still worshiping in the synagogue. And then after they were done worshiping in their traditional manner, they gathered as Christians in individual homes, not at churches. Think about it. There are no churches. Nothing has been built. There is a synagogue down the street, there's the temple in Jerusalem, and there's us as Christians meeting in the local neighborhood in probably whoever's house had the most room. That is literally probably why they chose what house they did. The piety of the family, the the faithfulness and the godliness of the family, and don't, don't, don't miss those words, because of the piety, the faithfulness of particular Groups of people who happened to have a home that was big enough, the parishes began to gather and be formed in the Christian household. Remember the word parish is a geographical term. It doesn't mean the building. It means a geographical area. A parish is a, is a neighborhood of believers that are close enough together that when it is time for the church to gather they are able to gather together in a particular place, uh, and ideally a place that would provide enough privacy uh, and shelter for them to worship together. So when we look at the, the church as communities of people, as parishes forming, it is founded 
absolutely on families being faithful, being the church at home. I think it would be historically and theologically accurate to say it is the family that precedes the parish. Pious families, godly families, moms and dads who love Christ and who are teaching their children to love Christ are, are the actual foundation on which what we ultimately uh, have as parish communities are built. It is on that family. Well, what kind of family then gives life to the church? Think of the example right here. We are in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a brand new Paris All Saints Church. How is this church going to come into being? It's a brand new church. Our hope is someday we will have a beautiful temple of our own filled with people being pastored by our beloved brother, Father John. How is that going to happen? Can it happen by force? Absolutely not. We can't tell anyone to go to church. As Father said in his lecture, Christ stands at the door and knocks, and we ha- when we have an icon of Christ standing on the door, there's not even a doorknob on the outside. Christ is not going to come in unless you invite him in, invite him in uh, unless you open the door from the inside. This parish here and every parish in our country, every parish in the world, new or old, will not come into existence, and it will not continue to exist unless there are specifically godly, Christ-loving families who desire its existence, and they bring it in themselves. The easiest way to get a parish going is for you, the people of God, you, the church, you, the ecclesia, the assembly, demanding, you demanding, that the priests serve you and your families, that the bishop know where you are, And that you need a parish within your geographic location. You need the church to be serving itself, which is you. That is how these things will come into existence. So if it's that important, if it is us as families that are going to build the church, that are going to call the Holy Spirit to come and sanctify a particular location on the earth, what are we to be doing But let's make sure that we know what we are not going to be doing. We're going to talk about what we're going to be doing. But I want to make sure we don't have any misunderstanding before we talk about what we will be doing. As we have already mentioned, the home church is not separate from the church at large. The home church ultimately is the church at large. You are the universal church. You may be members, but you make up the body. You are, you are the bricks that build the church. And so do not ever think that you are somehow separate from the church. You are the church, and the administration of the church is to be serving you. Another thing that we have to make sure is that when we are building the church, that we are not building it for three different reasons that I can think of uh, that often cause trouble in the church ultimately, or don't let the church be what it needs to be. And that is when the faithful come, and what they want ultimately in their home and in the parish is not sanctification, not salvation, but it could be perhaps for something like socialization. People coming to church because that is where their friends are. It's the most convenient place to see all their friends and that they are coming there because on Sunday is when I am able to socialize with the people that I am connected to. That is absolutely one of the natural benefits of being a part of the church. I see all of my friends at church when we gather together. Uh, When we have enough services and feast days and events at the church, we joke with each other that we don't want to see each other anymore. We've seen each other at church so much that we are, we are just absolutely full of all of the relationship and the, and the neighboring and the socialization that we can get. And that is a wonderful thing. But it can't be the cause. It can't be the reason that I come to church to socialize. I must be coming there in order to save my soul, to save the souls of those people that are in my life, and to give glory and worship to Christ as his body as our Savior, who has come into the world to redeem 
mankind. Another, another challenge that I see many places, and I offer this in, in much love and respect, but being an American convert to, to Orthodox Christianity, one of the things that I see happening in many places is that people are coming to church for the sake of culture, for the sake of culture. It's not just the Arabic community or the Russian community or the Greek community or the Serbian community or the Romanian community. We could just go down the list where when people come from nations that have been Orthodox a long time, Greece for 2,000 years, Russia for 1,000 years, that, it, that orthodoxy can become simply a part of my ethnic identity. I'm orthodox because I am Russian. I'm orthodox because I am Greek or I am Arabic. And it's, it's very common when converts to orthodoxy travel, people will want to know how, what are we? When I was on Mount Athos recently, when I was in Greece, people would say, Father Thaddeus, so, so are you Greek? No, I'm American. Were your parents Greek? No, they were American too. Your grandparents? Have you, you've all probably, maybe you've been on the other side of this conversation at one point. No, the apostolic church evangelized my family. And like those from Acts that we already mentioned, by the grace of God, my father and his household came into the Holy Orthodox Church. This is the real work of the church. We want to convert entire nations, entire nations. Go into the world to all nations and save them by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So I am, I am a fruit of that evangelistic work. But there is a temptation often for people to continue in their orthodoxy simply because it was what they were born into. And that is not enough. It is not enough to come to church to socialize. It is not enough to come to church to simply continue uh, in your own ethnic orientation. It is very rich and very, something to be very thankful for uh, within the, each of these individual cultures, but it cannot be exclusively that. And the third thing I thought of, which I have worked with pastorally with people, is coming to church out of superstition. If I don't go to church, God is going to do something bad to me, right? Coming, out of, coming to church, I, I find this as a convert priest to orthodoxy, I find this within the different ethnic circles that, that you know, my, my yaya, my grandmother, whoever it is, taught me that if I didn't come to church, bad things would happen. And I would like to relieve you of that problem. Bad things happen because of our free will, because of the choices we make, God allows us to suffer so that we will realize we're making mistakes. But God does not, God does not uh, come after us like the boogeyman. He does not relate to us through guilt. This is not a part of our faith. I can feel bad because of my own sins. I can have contrition. I can have repentance. But I do not, uh, if I'm being obedient to my spiritual father, I do not uh, nurture guilt. Guilt is a mix of pride and a mix of under, misunderstanding who God really is. So, what do we do when we are coming to church? We're coming to church because at, fa at home, we are the church. What does that look like? These are very simple things, and I'm not going to try and quote uh, many saints to try and convince you of these things. These are so fundamental to our faith that... Uh, if, you, if you don't agree with them, you need to just read any introduction to uh, Scripture or to the Orthodox practices. And yet, like Scripture, we become so overly familiar with the fundamentals that we often take them for granted. But if any of you who are in business or any of you who go to the gym to exercise, any of you who are in school, it is the fundamentals of those practices that makes you successful. It is doing the fundamental things over and over again that makes you successful in what you're doing. So at home, what are the things that we are doing that makes us obviously the church at home, the domestic church? When somebody walks into our house, they ought to know that we are Orthodox Christians. If that doesn't happen, something's wrong. So what are the things that show that an Orthodox home is an Orthodox home? One of the very most simple things is that we make the sign of the cross. 
all of the time for almost every reason. We make the sign of the cross when we say the name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We make the sign of the cross when we bless our food every time we eat. We make the sign of the cross when we say a prayer for someone. We make the sign of the cross as parents, as friends, as lay people in the church. We make the sign of the cross over other people, our children, our friends, uh, our work partners, our fellow students in school, in order to protect them and in order to bring healing into their lives. When we don't make the sign of the cross often, and this is not superstition, this is the theology of the church, and you are called to experiment with it until you understand by experience that it is true. You are called to make the sign of the cross as an action of power that has influence in the spiritual life. The saints teach us universally that the demons flee from the fire of the sign of the cross. When you make the sign of the cross, you are sanctifying yourself, the people that you make it over, your home, your car, whatever it is. Every time you get into your car, make the sign of the cross over the car. Every time you, a little priest at home, little P, little priest, little S saints, working out your salvation, the salvation of the people around you through this kind of piety. It is not superstition. We don't believe that by making the sign of cross, somehow we're going to appease God and things are going to go better because we're fated towards something evil and we're going to try and ward it off with the sign of the cross. That is all, all a misconception. It's all lies. We make the sign of the cross because Christ promises us that the power of the cross has saved the human race. And when we literally make the sign of the cross, the demons flee and the grace of God is made more receptive in our lives. It makes us more receptive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is why we make the sign of the cross. I want to grow spiritually. I want my family to be blessed and to be saved. Therefore, I make the sign of the cross all of the time. I tell people as a confessor, when you bless your food, when you bless your car, make the sign of the cross three times. If you only do it once, it'll become a habit, and you'll forget what you're doing. You'll start doing it haphazardly. If you do it three times, the very first time I was taught this uh, by a, a monastic, if you make the sign of the cross the first time, it's out of obedience. The church asks you to bless your food, to bless yourself, to bless everything around you and protect it and heal it with the sign of the cross. So do it out of obedience. Well, if I do it once, I do it out of obedience. But if I have to do it three times, the second time I make it, it causes enough pause in my life that I start contemplating what I'm actually doing. And the third time that I make it, I make it with attention and intent that, that evil be driven away and good brought in by the power of, your Holy, of the Holy Spirit. So your food, your car, your pets, your friends, doesn't matter, make the sign of the cross for blessing, healing, and protection. We also, as Orthodox Christian families, we have icons in our homes. And we, have, we, are, we are a post-iconoclastic society. That's a fancy way of saying we put icons everywhere, everywhere everywhere. There should be an icon in every single room of your house. Not out of superstition, I'm going to keep on saying that, but for beautification of your home and for blessings and remembrance of our relationship, our actual authentic relationship with Christ, the Holy Theotokos, and all of the saints, particularly the patrons of our family members and of our home. We are visual people. We encounter the world through our senses. And when we surround ourselves with icons, our, our eyes are constantly reminding us of the spiritual reality that we're trying to live. So we put icons everywhere in our home. The icons are particularly concentrated in places in our home where we pray. There will be a lot of icons there in our prayer corner, at our prayer shelf, or in our prayer closet. In the home, there should be somewhere that is obvious that we do our prayers. Christ says, when you pray, not if. He does not say, if you pray. He doesn't say, if you fast, either. He says, when you pray, go into your closet. There's an assumption being made there. An obvious assumption, we've heard this 300,000 times, but many of us are still not doing it. 
He says, when you pray, go in your closet. And when you have closed the door, pray in this way. And we say the Lord's Prayer many, many times in our services. Maybe at home we say the Lord's Prayer all the time. How many of us have a closet at home full of icons where we're going to pray? We have to have this reality. I can promise you this. I can promise you this. If you literally get one of your closets and empty it out and fill it with icons and start doing your prayers there, miracles will happen in your home. Not out of superstition. Not because you are finally appeasing the God who is waiting for you to be good. But because prayer and the sanctification of space, just like we do in the churches, we fill them with icons. Why? Because it's conducive to prayer. And when you go into your closet at home, surrounded by icons, just like in the, in the temple, you will find that prayer is easier and that your home is more greatly sanctified. When, it, when guests come into your house, if they do not see that you are Orthodox Christians because you're blessing the food and you've got icons on the wall and you, and you say, oh, wait for so-and-so, they're almost done with their prayers in the closet, people know that you are Christians and you are living the life of Christianity. You are not just thinking about Christian things. The knowledge that we have in, the, in our mind must descend into our heart and be a part of our being and start manifesting itself in our actions, in what we do. We are not a people that thinks the right thing. We are the, we are the people who lives the right way. So we are also saying prayers with our icons. We're saying prayers when we wake up in the morning. We are saying prayers in the evening. It is better to pray anything, the shortest, tiniest prayer, one cross and one Lord have mercy when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed than not. It is better to pray anything than to not pray at all. You don't need to pray for 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour or five hours. You need to get to the end of the day and say, did I pray today? This is how I encourage many of the people who, who uh, confess with me. I tell them, don't ask yourself how long you're praying or what you prayed. Ask yourself, did you pray? And if the answer is yes, you're on the right track. If the answer is no, you must start praying. We pray also over our meals before and after we eat. Now, I touched on, on fasting a little bit, and I want to say something about that. Like prayer, Christ did not say to us, if you fast. We, that, is, that is a one word in Scripture, and we must not ignore it. He does not say, if you fast. He says, when you fast. And that means that all Orthodox Christians are expected to fast. Again, this is not because God doesn't like food. He created it all. He taught us to break bread together. He had mystical suppers. But fasting is, is a fundamental action of the body that complements the fundamental action of prayer for your soul. We have to be praying with our flesh just as we pray with our soul. And so fasting is, is imperative that we enter into it. And I'll give you, if you're not fasting... I'll give you some good news. You don't have to do it all at once. It's just like exercise. It's just like learning to do anything new. First, you admit that you're bad at it. That's the first step. First, you admit that you're not doing it, or that even though Christ said, when you fast, that you haven't taken that seriously. And then you simply begin. You start on Wednesdays and Fridays. Perhaps with the blessing of your spiritual father, that is a key phrase, with the blessing of your spiritual father, maybe in the beginning all you're fasting from is meat. And then the second year you're fasting from dairy as well. I can tell you from personal experience that it's like any other habit. When we first start, it's difficult. After a few years of doing it, we don't even notice we are. It's easy. And, and uh, I, I have learned to love the fast. We have four major fasts during the year. The Nativity Fast, the Lenten Fast, the Apostles Fast, the Dormition Fast. These are times where then we fast for an extended period of time for the sake of prayer, increased prayer. 
So many of these things you might have to go to your priest and talk, to about, talk about with them or find out uh, how to start specifically and get a blessing for what you do. But remember always that Christ is saying when you fast, not if you fast. Another thing that we have to be doing in our homes, remember, and I'm not, I'm not talking about at church, all of this I am talking about in the home. We have icons in the home, we're praying in the home, we're making the sign of the cross in the home, we're fasting in the home. And by the way, the very easiest way to fast as a home is to fast all together. Don't, don't ever start a fast that some of you are keeping and some of you are not. Don't do that. Don't do that. You fast together and you grow together. I've seen moms who uh, were stuck making multiple meals because some people are fasting, other people weren't, some people are fasting with these, that, that terrible, terrible uh, decision to make. It is better for you to all fast together than to be fasting individually. And the weaker person sets the pace. The weaker person sets the pace, not the zealot. The weaker person sets the pace. Now, in our home, also as a family, that means brothers and sisters working together, mothers and fathers working together, neighborhoods working together, church communities working together, we are to be doing good deeds. We are to be doing acts of mercy. We are to be giving alms to the poor. And so as a family, once again, this is not the priest organizing this activity. This is not the church as a whole organizing it. This is not the bishop taking responsibility. This is you, the church, we, the church, at home, choosing, identifying opportunities to do good works and then going and doing them. Who is the person in your neighborhood that needs some help? Regardless of who they are, regardless of they are, if they are Orthodox, regardless if they are Christian or not, regardless of whether or not they are a friend or an enemy, who needs help? Go do it as a family. Find a poor family that needs help or needs some financial assistance. Find, find elderly people that need some work in their house or their yard. Where I am, there are many, many homeless people everywhere. Uh, lots of drug addiction, many opportunities to be uh, charitable in our works. But when mom and dad and brothers and sisters say, let's go do a good work, it will transform your home. It will bring the grace of the Holy Spirit into your house. Every time we, we exert our own will to do something of Christ and his church, it makes us more receptive to the Holy Spirit coming into our life, into our heart, into our family, to a greater extent than, than when we don't do these things. Christ stands at the door and knocks. Let's open the door to him and the Holy Spirit. So look for works uh, of mercy to do and be creative. Be creative. Go across the street and mow somebody's lawn. And when they ask you, why are you doing this? You, then you tell them, I'm a Christian. Go down to a food bank and volunteer. Come and, and, and look for, par for families within the parishes that need help some way. And as a community, come together and serve them. When this becomes important in your life and you start doing it, our, our faith descends from our head into our heart and the holiness of our family begins to grow. Now, as a family, we also worship. As a family, we come to church. One of the worst divisions I, I see in families is when mom and dad or the sons and daughters are not of one mind as to what they're going to do liturgically. When it's sun, Sunday morning comes, somebody is saying, let's go to church, and someone else in the family is saying, I don't want to. I'm too tired today. Uh, or mom and dad saying, we're going to go to church, and asking their children, do you want to go? Don't do that, please. My father was an Orthodox priest. My father-in-law was an Orthodox priest. And when my wife and I, even though we both had grown up going to church to every service that the church did, I was an acolyte, she was in the choir, we were, we were always at church. When we were married, we realized one day that we had to decide to go to church now. We weren't with mom and dad. They weren't getting up and driving the car, and we just had to get into the car, and everyone else was doing it, so we were going to do it too. We had to decide. And early on as a young couple, we said to each other, 
Let's never ask each other if you want to go to church. Never. When Sunday morning comes and the alarm goes off, we get up and we get dressed and we go to church. And we never talk about it. We talk about being too sick to go to church. Now that we have four kids, we talk about who might stay home with the kids because the kids are sick. We never say, do we want to go to church? And, and the blessing of that was that we were so used to it by the time we started having children, our children don't know any better. Our children, have, they've never been asked, do you want to go to church? And I, I wasn't always a priest, by the way, I, most of the time with our children, but we don't ever ask. It is our family tradition that we go to church on Saturday night and Sunday morning without question. And we make that a priority. We don't let our, their sports disturb that. We don't let family events disturb that. We don't let friends disturb that. Saturday night and Sunday morning, we spend with our church community voluntarily because we have brought our little church at home to the great assembly on Sunday morning. We also try to go at least once during the week. Our, our parish has the, the blessing of, of having daily vespers during the week and so on, and evening during the week uh, we will go as well, as long as we can. But Saturday night and Sunday morning, of course, are the biggest. Now, one of the things that's involved with worship is entering into the sacraments. And everyone in the church, everyone who is a member of the home church, the household that is Orthodox Christian, has been brought in through baptism and chrismation. So two, two sacraments that we have entered into. Some of us have been married and received the sacrament of marriage. We're hoping that our children grow up and receive the sacrament of marriage too. But the two sacraments that we enter, enter into most often as the home church is that we voluntarily, as a family, enter into confession and receiving communion. It is a family plan. We are going to go to confession this Saturday night as a family. And dad goes and then mom goes and then the kids all go. We're all doing it together. It is so easier, easy and easier to get through the Christian life when we do it uh, as a team. If I am alone trying to decide to do what's right, it's so difficult, even as a priest. If I am alone, if I'm isolated, it's very difficult to live the Christian life. If I am surrounded my, by my brothers in the priesthood, it makes it much easier, much easier. Well, in the family, it's the same. If, if just mom, these poor mothers is trying to save the family by making sure they get the kids to church once in a while, make sure that they get to communion or, or confession once a year, and, 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 and most likely it's dad who is too busy with work and not supportive of these activities. It is very hard to bring holiness into our families. The minute the family as a whole gets together, literally sits down at the dinner table and says, we are Orthodox Christians and we are going to start living a life that is pleasing to God. And that is going to start with many of these things I've mentioned, but it's going to start also with we as a family are going to enter into the sacraments of confession and communion. And, and the secret, this is not because of their holiness, by the way. I, I am a father, I can say this. It's not because of their holiness. It is because of the order that God creates for the family. When dad says that's going to happen, it is the most powerful thing that can happen in the family. When father, who, who maybe is not even the most spiritually inclined person in the family, it doesn't matter. It's okay if he's not. Many times mom is the most spiritually inclined. When dad says we are a Christian family and we are going to enter into the sacraments together, we are going to go as a family and confess. We are going to go as a family and receive communion. The family, once again, is transformed. So do these things. By the way, everything that I'm talking about right now is on a, a little checklist that you may have been handed out when you came in, some of the paperwork that you got. Does anybody have that with them right now? Because these are a lot of things, but I want you to take that checklist home and be honest with yourselves about uh, how to grow the family church at home. Another aspect of worship that may surprise you an act of worship that may surprise you is tithing. We do not give money to the church because we owe it. We, not, we do not give money to the church because we feel guilty if we do not give money. 
We do not give money to the church only because the church has bills to pay. Tithing, when we stop and we study the, the, the tradition that comes before the giving of the law to Moses in the Old Testament and was practiced by the early church until now. When we study tithing, giving 10% of our income to the church, it is an act of worship. We bring to God 10% of the bounty he, he has given to us. It is not our money. It is a gift of God to us and our family. It is God that gave us the intellect to have the job that we have. It is God that helped us get through college if we did. It's God who gave us a set of skills that we use at our job to support our family. It is God that supplied in his providence the house that we live in or the car that we drive. And so when we realize it all belongs to God, and then out of, out of gratitude for the bounty that he has given us, Christians have always given back to God 10% of what he has given to them. If we, if we take this idea that my money is mine, then we feel like we're getting a bill when the church asks us to tithe when we realize that we would have nothing, we would not even have our life, our existence, if it was not given by God, then we realize it is out of love and gratitude. It is an offering we give back to God because of the bounty that he has given us. So tithing is an act of worship. In the old days, when everybody just had sheep or goats or camels or whatever it was, it was, they were raising, if they were uh, an agri uh, agricultural society and they were growing wheat or corn or whatever it was, when you stood in the field and you watched God bring into existence all of the baby sheep and all the baby goats and all the baby camels, when you watched God take a seed of grain and turn it into this incredible plant of wheat or of corn, you knew that it was a miracle of God that you were going to be having the food that you had or having the ability to barter with what God had given you. And so to give back to God 10% of that bounty was very obvious and easy. Nowadays, because our company gives us a paycheck, and maybe it's even an automatic deposit. We don't even, the money doesn't even pass through our hands anymore. It's very easy to start thinking that I have earned this. It's a, it's a, it's a fruit of my bounty. I have brought it into existence. And then we have a very hard time giving. Uh, there is also uh, a habit that we have from the established churches in nations where the church has been the source of financial support for people. People come from the Middle East or they come from Russia or they come from Greece and they're used to the church being a source of financial support for them. And the answer to that is you must realize we are in a missionary field here in America. We are not Orthodox Christians in a, in a state where the, the church uh, is, is well established. We are in a missionary field, and the church must grow that mission. And so we have to have your support. We have to have your support. We do not have a state that is collecting, ta collecting taxes and then giving the church money. We don't have that system of economy anymore. So it, it is up to us sacrificing out of gratitude that we prosper the church. So I exhort you to, to go home and to think about these, these very fundamental things. When is prayer being said and where is it being said? Where are the icons in our home? How often do we talk about God? And, and I would exhort you in the end that one of the most important things that you can do with your family, and this is usually this is the most profound thing, Parents can imagine putting up some more icons in the home. Parents can imagine uh, going to church more often, maybe. Parents can imagine having a place in their house to pray. That would be a wonderful thing. But the thing you have to do more than anything as families, I don't just mean mom and dad, but brothers and sisters, friends, neighborhoods as well, is you have to be talking about God. You have to be talking about God. There is nothing more powerful you can do in your family unit, in your home church, than having God and his importance in your life and what you're reading about or what you learned when you went to church or, or what you're studying in the scriptures that day and making it a, a topic of discussion in your life. 
So many of us can have all the icons up and we can have a prayer closet and we can be making the sign of the cross and we still have not overcome the, the, the burden, the, the hesitation to be bold enough in our faith to talk to our own family members about how important God is in our life. So be talking about God in your home. When we pray, we talk with God. But it's not enough to do that only. We must be in our home church talking about God as well. So allow your homes to be transformed. I promise you that as, as basic as this information is that I've shared with you today, that if you do it, if you do it, you will experience God in your home in a degree that you have not yet. I promise that. And the Orthodox Christian spiritual life is, in the end, an experience. It is not information. The information help, helps us get to the experience. But we must enter into the experience of God working actively in our life. And that will not happen unless we are creating the opportunities in our homes for uh, increasing our re receptivity, our personal receptivity to the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that I would like to exhort you with before we end today is that, is that you would have in your heart and mind the, the, the knowledge that in the end, every Orthodox Church throughout 2,000 years of history in every ethnicity, every culture, every nation around the world has eventually striven, worked to found schools. After the family the most amount of time we all spend in the world is in school. Later on, it might be work. But when we are in formative stages, when we are young, the thing that undermines our faith the most, potentially, is being in a school setting where our faith is not supported. And this is a huge endeavor, a huge endeavor that I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you to take lightly. But... Our parish is blessed and has been for 30 years to have a kindergarten through eighth grade. And after the holiness of the family, the family's work to be the church at home and to gather together at the great assembly on Sundays, the greatest thing that a family can do is to put their kids into an Orthodox school and to receive regular Orthodox instruction when they are young. So keep that in your mind. Every great saint who has converted nations does so by founding schools. So have that in the back of your mind. And I pray that you would all be blessed. I pray that Christ would enter in, that knocking at your door, you would open it to him in very, very fundamental and, and actually convenient ways. But that the power of the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit would come into your home and make it the church that it is so that the church can become what Christ has called it to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.